Hi, welcome again. Um, in this little short lecture, I'm going to talk about stoichiometric networks. Now, previously, we've been talking about um, kinetics of single reactions, but of course, in reality, a cell is composed of thousands upon thousands of reactions forming a network. Okay, so you might have species A getting converted to B, which then gets converted to C. B itself may get converted to D, D may get converted back to C and so on. So you may have, you know, a series of chemical reactions connect, connected to form a network and I call those um, stoichiometric networks. So let's, um, now let's start with a simple example, how, what we might do with these stoichiometric networks or how we might deal with them and study them. So let's uh, start with a simple network. A goes to B, goes to C, okay two reactions, two reaction rates, V1 and V2. Um, if we ran, let's say we did an experiment and uh, we measured A, B and C. Okay, and let's say we started A at, uh, there and B and C were both down here. And we let this run, let the, the two chemical reactions run. We'd see, and let's assume that uh, both reactions are irreversible, okay? They're irreversible, so they only go in one direction. So if we start A at a high level, we'd probably notice it declining, and eventually it would reach zero as it completely run, ran out. Now it reached zero because the reaction is irreversible, and it would keep on going until it completely ran out of A. In the meantime, B, so maybe we'll do, we'll do some color coding here. B would rise, but then, of course, it runs out of A and then slowly declines as well, down to zero. And then finally, C, what happens to C? Well, C starts to rise. There may be a little bit, maybe a little uh, kink at the bottom. Then it goes up and then reaches uh, up. That's not a very good one, is it? So it goes up like that, right? So it reaches a plateau. So we might see some, some dynamics like that in a simple pathway like this. Uh, so the question is, how would we describe this uh, mathematically you know, if we wanted to run a simulation like this? But what we normally do, of course, we, we write down uh, differential equations. So I'd write down a differential equation for A. I'd write down a differential equation for B. And I'd write down a differential equation for C. So let me just write it down here again. So we've got it here. A goes to B goes to C. These are the two rates, V1 and V2. So what's the rate at which A changes? Now remember we earlier we had this, um, uh, the reaction rate was defined as the rate of change, some compound X divided by its stoichiometric coefficient, okay? So I can rearrange that so that I get, in fact, let me just, uh, Oops, let me just bring this down. Okay, so I can rearrange this so that dx, dx by dt equals cxv, okay? So this is the form in which I'm going to write these three equations down, all right? Uh, so let's see, um, so, so what's the rate of change A? Well, rate of change A, so, Remember, these are irreversible rate step reactions too. So A is just disappearing. Um, its stoichiometric coefficient, Ca is minus one, right? because it's a reactant, so its stoichiometric coefficient is minus one. And that means that if I use this, this equation here, that means dA by dt is minus V1, right? So it's just telling us that A is disappearing at a rate V1. Um, what about C? Let's do C because that's the, uh, the, the next easiest one. Well, C is being made at a rate V2. So that's positive. So it's being made at a rate V2. Okay. So those are the two um, differential equations for A and C. What about B? So this is where it gets more interesting. So B is actually being made at a rate V1 and it's disappearing at a rate V2. Now you can get those, you can get this equation by considering this as well, but it becomes second nature, you know, after maybe a few seconds, you'll realize that it's quite straightforward to write the differential equations in terms of these rates for any network. In fact, for this one here, maybe we want to do this one here. So let's, 
write down the rates here, V1, V2, V3, V4. Uh, let's I'll put a D there, I guess, and then that's V5. Okay, let's write down the rate of change of B. Right, the rate of change of B, well, it's coming in, there's mass coming into B from V1, so it's plus V1, and it's disappearing by two roots, minus V2 and minus V3. So basically all we're doing, we're just using conservation of mass to take into account you know, the inflows and the outflows at a particular uh, species. For D, let's do another one, rate of change of D, uh, where it's coming in at V2 and it's disappearing at V4. Okay. And then finally for C, DC by DT, uh, we're coming in at V3, uh, we're also coming in at V4, so it's a plus, but we're disappearing, that's a five, disappearing at V5, okay? So in general, if you have a node, let's say node X, and you have multiple things coming in and multiple things leaving, we'll call these the inflow, the inflow, the inflows. We'll call these the outflows. The rate of change, oops, X should be, the rate of change of X is basically the sum of all the inflows minus the sum of all the outflows, okay? Remember, this is the summation, summation symbol. Okay, that's the summation symbol. Just means add, add all the inflows together, and this means add all the outflows together. Uh, so we can we could do this for any uh, network we wanted to. And in fact, most software does this automatically for you. You just have to specify, you know, the network, be it this form, and it'll automatically generate the differential equations. Now, these, this side can look a little bit messy like this. There's lots of uh, terms being added and terms being subtracted. And you can imagine for a very large network, right, let's say, you know, the whole of human metabolism, this right-hand side could become particularly big and messy. And so there are alternative ways to express these things, perhaps a more compact way, although you might think you're not really hiding anything here, but let's, um, let's look at an example and I'll show you what I mean. So let's have three steps, V1, V2, V3. Uh, I don't care about the source and sink, we assume they're, they're fixed. Um, the differential equations for this, Right, it's coming in at V1, disappearing at V2, and then B is uh, appearing at V2 and disappearing at V3. Now, there's a way to turn these equations into matrix form. And the way we do that is we'll have, we'll put the rates of change into a vector. Right? So we'll take all the rates of change, put them into a, a column vector. Then I'll have a matrix representing the, uh, the topology of the network, right? Then I'll have a final vector here, another column vector, which will include all the rates, okay? So what goes in the middle here? Well, the middle, this this piece here, the columns will be the reaction rates and the rows will be the species. And at the intersections of these two, we'll put the stoichiometric coefficient. So for example, V1, that's V1, with respect to A, well, that has a stoichiometric coefficient of plus one, okay? Um, A, with respect to V2, it has a stoichiometric coefficient of minus one, and you notice that A doesn't appear in B at all, so uh, that that's just a zero. The next row, uh, V1, well, B isn't involved in V1 at all, so that's a zero. Uh, for V2, B is being made, stoichiometric coefficient of one. And for V3, well, B is disappearing at a minus one stoichiometric coefficient. So in this way, I can express uh, the sort of, I can separate the, what's advantageous here is I can separate the kinetics from the topology on the topology of the uh, network. And I've, I've sometimes called this the system equation for uh, systems biology, right? the system equation. And if I, 
I can write this in more compact form. So if I go dx by dt, so that now is a vector. I put a bar on it to indicate there's a vector. I have a stoichiometric, uh, I have a matrix here, which I'm gonna call M. I'll come back to that in a minute. And I'll have a rate vector V, okay? Now this N, depending on what field you're in, is given a different symbol. In the constraint flux balance analysis, constraint-based community, they tend to use S. In the more uh, dynamics community, uh, historically, it's always been N. So I'm going to stick with N. N stands for number. Basically, it's the number or numbers of molecules involved in the reactions. And it's called the stoic cometric matrix. Okay, the stoichiometric matrix. Um, what about, uh, you should talk, say something about dimensions. Uh, dimensions. Let's say, um, let's say N is the number of uh, species, chemical species. Uh, it's called M is the number of reactions, right? Or well, actually, no, let me um, call it something else. I'll call it um, R. R is the number of reactions, number of reactions, okay? Now, do the dx by dt, has n species, so it's n, but it's one column, so it's n by one. Uh, the rate vector has r reactions, but it's one column, so it's r by one. If you remember your rules of matrix multiplication, uh, the inner the inner dimensions have to match, so that has to be an r here, and the outer dimension has to match the outer dimension on, on the other side, so it's an n, so it's n by r matrix. Okay, and that corresponds to the fact that N is the number of species and R is the number of uh, reactions, okay? Um, okay, um, so one thing to bear in mind in, with the, the stoichiometric uh, matrices, there's nothing about um, reversibility in the matrix. Anything about reversibility of reactions is in the rate vector. So let me just write that down here. Uh, so dx by dt equals n, I'll put a there or there, and then v. Um, nothing about reversibility. Nothing about reversibility is in n. Everything to do with the kinetics, whether it's reversible, where the things are being regulated by things, will always occur in the V vector, okay? So it's a complete separation from the kinetics and the topology. And this has been quite important because, um, you know, there's a whole industry that studies N, right? The properties of N, and there are various interesting properties of N that we can come to in, a, in a, some later talks that are very interesting to know. And so even though you may not know the kinetics of the system, you can still do a lot by studying the, the properties and the structure of N. Um, I think that's about it for this time. What we'll do next time is I'll show you some more uh, tricky examples of how to um, construct a stoichiometric matrix when you have non-unit stoichiometry, but it, you should find it straightforward. Okay, thanks now.